morning, everyone. And uh, uh, I'm probably I'm the chairman of the CEO of Baidu. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be the monitor of this uh, extraordinary panel. In the middle, uh, we have uh, Bill Gates, the co-chairman of uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, former the chairman and CEO of Microsoft. He's still the technology advisor of Microsoft, right? And uh, on the uh, left, we have Elon Musk. Uh, he is uh, CEO and uh, CTO of SpaceX, and uh, CEO and uh, chief technology architect of uh, uh, Tesla, and uh, chairman of Tesla. Uh, so uh, welcome both Bill and Elon. Uh, so, uh, roughly uh, two weeks ago, when I agreed to be the moderator of this, this panel, I posted a, a message um, uh, by Du Keba uh, soliciting questions from the, the, the internet users. I got more than 500 questions for two of you, and uh, uh, I'm going to select a, a one question for each, and uh, on behalf of the users, I'd like to, um, uh, to ask. So, so for Bill, uh, we have a question from a very ambitious uh, person. He said, as a young man who intends to overtake you as the world's richest man, what kind of vision do I require and uh, what specific advice would you give me, Bill? Well, fortunately, uh, I don't think there's any single metric that uh, defines excellence. You know, hopefully that person has some ideas or he sees beyond the current generation. My luck was to be born at a time when computing was going from a, a very centralized, extensive form where the amount of software that was needed was very, very modest. And so it wasn't even considered the magic element of the system. The hardware just keeping it running and buying it, babysitting it, uh, was the center of the industry. And yet, because the microprocessor chip was coming along and, and essentially, from my point of view, making computing free and storage free and eventually even uh, epigrammet free, I could conceive of a form of software in terms of a tool for the individual uh, that was radically different than any other software. I remember at the time the industry award for the top selling software was if you sold 10,000 copies, you got their big trophy and they gave you a big bag to it. Well, our basic had sold 6 million copies. So I, I called them up and I said, well, what do you have for 6 million? Uh, they were like, what? What kind of software are you talking about? And so it was really utterly different. You know, for this gentleman, hopefully at a young age, he'll see um, how to you know, make robots, or how to make assistants, or uh, some way of making software development far more efficient than it is today. And even though so many things have changed, uh, if you look at, you know, say, the code that defines a website, uh, or you know, the code you write for business applications, I have to say, I would, if you'd asked me 40 years ago what that would look like, I would have predicted uh, that it would be much easier to do business applications, much easier to write highly reliable code. So there, you know, there's an opportunity uh, for somebody. And it's not just in software. If they can invent you know, a way of making energy cheap and uh, CO2-free, uh, see a twist of using technology to do that, uh, I'd say that would be a, a, a kind of a mind-blowing contribution. So the room for innovation, the speed for innovation is better uh, today than ever. In my case, I didn't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to be better than IBM or something. I didn't have the same <laughs> confidence that this person had. Uh, I knew I loved software. I wanted to mess around with it. Uh, and it led to you know, being able to create a company. But I didn't know at any, at any point in time, part of the reason I think I ran the company well, is I thought, Okay, maybe the company will be twice as big, but we get ready for that. I never said, well, of course, it will be gigantic, because then you might skip all the hard work of 
scaling up that factor of two, and I thought, okay, this is it. You know, I just have to build a management system for 5,000 people. If you said to me when I had 10 people and I tried on the code, hey, you'll have 100,000 people, I would have laughed. I would have said, wow, how many bugs can you create with 100,000 people? I don't, I don't want 100,000 people. Uh, so, you know, I, I wish you good luck. So you're saying you don't really need to be this ambitious in order to be successful, right? Well, I don't think, I, we can ask Elon, I don't think any of us assume that, that things would line up uh, to create, uh, in his case, multiple successes that are, are pretty fantastic. I think if you had that, uh, you, you knew that, you didn't think it was a risk, uh, I'm not sure you would, you would actually get there. What other characteristics are, would you look for for a um, potential um, <clears throat> successful enterprise? Well, there, you know, people who end up being successful are, are often, not always, they're pretty fanatical about the thing they're trying to do. I remember one industry panel uh, where there were about seven people and the debate was, would the computer interface be this character mode thing, or would it be graphics user interface? And uh, at the time, the graphics user interface stuff was so slow, it was laughable. And writing software was so bad, it was Windows 1.0. And uh, so the people on the panel were saying, no, no, this, this is kind of a stupid thing. And I was saying, no, no, believe me, this will be great. And one of the guys on the panel said that, the, hey, Bill is wrong. But Bill works harder than the rest of us, so even though it's the wrong solution, he's likely to succeed. And that was the best compliment I ever had, was <laughs> just by working day and night, I could send the industry in some funny direction. Uh, so, you know, I was fanatical in that period of time. That is, I didn't believe in vacation, I, I didn't believe in weekends. Uh, you know, so it turned out that worked for me, that we got our company going at a speed that allowed it to make mistakes faster than, than other people were and kind of see those mistakes. And many software companies at the time thought of themselves as a single product company. And they were literally designed to be a single product company. And they thought of, that their sales were mostly going to be in the United States. We, from the beginning, planned to be a multi-product company. Uh, you know, basically, I don't know if people have ever heard of that, was our basic interpreter that ran on a bunch of computers was our very first product. And of course today, uh, they're still around, but you know, people use JavaScript for a lot of the things that, that BASIC uh, was used for that. So we had a, a, a conception of a very big company, and we knew what we were about with software. Hiring software people and writing lots and lots of software, not a specific piece of software. So that helped us a lot. And we said we're going to have the world's most efficient software factory. Uh, Elon has to actually build buildings and buy equipment to make the Gigafactory. We set up a Gigafactory of software, which is with a bunch of guys uh, with better symbolic debuggers and better simulators and compilers and uh, things like that. And we, you know, we didn't get uh, other companies were, were also doing that. But we were somewhat ahead in terms of being serious about high quality software development. All right. Uh, question for Elon. Uh, also from our internet users. I'm so curious that I'm going to explode. How does Elon Musk have the energy and enthusiasm to accomplish so many great things? It's incredible, it's just too cool. Does he do things step by step, or does he have huge goals already set for projects that have just hatched? Uh, sure, well, I think, first of all, it's, it's I'm gonna start going back to what Will said. You don't actually expect things to be big. In fact, uh, I mean, at the beginning, I expected that I thought we would fail. That, that was the most likely outcome by far, actually. I thought maybe ten percent chance of success for SpaceX, something similar for Tesla. And if you look at the, the track record of uh, you know, space startups and car startups, it's pretty bad. Uh, so it's not from the standpoint of like, wow. You know, if you're to rank order and say uh, what, what, I'm just start a company, what's like the highest return on investment for the risk? Uh, like the, the, right at the bottom of the list of, of the least desirable would be something in space and, and cars. You know, it's just, it's not, it's, it's a graveyard. So, but 
the uh, so don't want to be complacent at this point, but um, we came very close to, to both Tesla and SpaceX and Solar City all, all dying at the end of 2008. So, yeah, it's, it, but in terms of how, how it's, it's really just that I thought there were these important problems that needed to get solved, and it didn't seem as though anyone was really solving them. Um, you know, with respect to Tesla and Solar City, it's about trying to accelerate the advancement of sustainable energy, sustainable energy production for Solar City, sustainable energy consumption in the case of, of Tesla. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when, we, when we started Tesla, electric cars were just sort of as the stupidest thing. Um, but they really, I mean, like, so, so the company was, the car company was sort of stupid. So the electric car company was stupidly square. Um, and uh, we, we, we narrowly escaped that so many times. So it's not, uh, there wasn't some grand plan. Um, the expectation was there. That was the most likely. But the, the follow-up question would be, how can you manage so many things that you have three companies? Uh, well, I don't, I don't recommend this. I really... It's not good for quality of life. Uh, and I, I, should, I should emphasize that I, I run SpaceX and Tesla, but I don't run Solar City. I provide kind of strategic guidance. Um, fortunately, the team there does an amazing job, and I, it's like one day a month, that type of thing. Uh, Tesla and SpaceX are kind of like every day, <laughs> every weekend, every right. holiday. Not just as CEO, you're also in charge of technology, product. Uh, Are you a very detail-oriented person? We, we have like, we have a, a really talented team there, so I just want to emphasize that uh, sometimes I get, in fact, most of the time I get way too much credit or attention for what I do. I'm just like the visible element, uh, but, but the reason those companies are successful is because we have extremely talented uh, people at all levels. Uh, that'll make it happen. I really don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, and and uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I do it because I, I feel like I'm responsible for these things, not because it's necessarily the best thing for quality of life. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Got it. Uh, so among the you know, five hundred questions, when, when I went through those questions, one thing I noticed is that uh, uh, for, for questions to build. Uh, most of the questions are Microsoft related. And I understand you spend more time on uh, your foundation than on Microsoft these days. Uh, do you really think you are making a bigger contribution to humanity, um, uh, your foundation, uh, uh, through your foundation, than you did through Microsoft? In other words, let's say 100 years from now, would you be rather be remembered as the founder of Microsoft or as a great philanthropist? Well, I hope you, I'm alive in two years from now. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to remember me as long as I get to do fun work uh, like I am now. You know, the, the biggest part of the economy is the private sector. And when you think, you know, why are things going to be better 20 years from now, 30 years from now, the vast majority of that's going to come out of private sector companies. What the digital revolution is at an early stage, and so companies like uh, uh, Baidu, Google, Apple, Microsoft—they're making a huge contribution. The tools that they create that get used in so many domains—you know, just think education is one domain that over time we haven't seen it yet, but over time that should make ability to connect up to what somebody's learning and um, what their goals and aspirations are. So this is incredible stuff. And anybody who had a chance to be part of that, particularly to build a good-sized company, uh, made a, a huge contribution. What I saw uh, uh, was that my the most unique thing I could do uh, starting in my 50s was to be full-time at the foundation. That is, that there were other great people uh, who could take the mantle of Microsoft. When I, when I was running Microsoft in my 20s and 30s, I, I always thought, you know, for sure that it should never have a CEO over 45. Uh, because who could keep up with all this stuff? So then, you know, as I found myself in my 50s still 
uh, the company was like, oh, I told myself I shouldn't still be here. Uh, and anyway, the foundation work, which uh, is in partnership with my wife, Melinda, became more appealing. And I was saying to myself, gosh, who's going to work on malaria? It, it appeared to be more of a vacuum uh, that organizing science and government to take these problems that are a little bit hidden away in these poor countries where most people don't actually go and see the, the depredations of malnutrition and infectious disease. And so it feared like an opportunity that showed up that could take all the skills of organizing people and energizing people uh, in the software evolution now in a slightly different domain, but, but the skills of running teams and uh, picking scientists and being patient about things that take 10 or 15 years to have a breakthrough. Uh, I can take all of that. Um, and so I'm, I think for this phase of my life, this is my biggest contribution and the most fun. It's nice when you decide those two things are the same. Uh, uh, but in my 20s, I would not have been satisfied at doing this. And so I think in China, the image is more about the Microsoft, because the uh, foundation isn't that visible. Your most work of the foundation is in poor countries. We are trying to build more and more relationships because there's so much innovation in China that can help in Africa, whether it's in health or agriculture or cell phone magic. Um, so that, that's a growing thing. So you should come to China more often? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you and I had a uh, uh, short debate on artificial intelligence last night. I, uh, I want to bring uh, that topic up here too. Uh, I also uh, understand recently you said that uh, um, artificial intelligence advances is like um, summoning the demon. Uh, that generated a lot of uh, hot debate. Uh, by the chief scientist, Andrew Yin, uh, recently said during an interview, uh, that worrying about the dark side of um, artificial intelligence is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. How would you address that? He, he said it, it's, it's a distraction to with, um, the scientists being artificial intelligence. I, I, don't think, I think that's a uh, sort of radically inaccurate analogy. But, um, <laughs> I, know, I know a bit about Mars. Um, so, the, the uh, the, the, the risks uh, with uh, sort of digital superintelligence, and, and it's important to appreciate that it would be it wouldn't be just human level; it would be superhuman, almost to the end. It would just survive past humans to be way way beyond uh, anything we can really uh, imagine. Uh, I think a more perfect analogy would be like uh, if, you, if you instead of saying nuclear research, with the potential for a very very dangerous weapon, you um, yeah, releasing the energy. Uh, is easy. Um, uh, containing that energy safely is very difficult. And so the, the right, I think the right emphasis for AI research is on AI safety. We should uh, put vastly more effort into AI safety than we should put into advancing AI in the first place. Uh, because it, it may be good or it may be bad. And it, it could be catastrophically bad. Uh, it, it could be the equivalent of uh, nuclear meltdown. So you really want to emphasize safety. I, so I'm not saying I'm not against the advancement of AI. Yeah, this is I want to really be clear about this. But I I do think uh, we should be extremely careful. And if that means it takes a bit longer to develop AI, then I think that's that's the right trail. Um, we shouldn't be rushing headlong into something that we don't understand. Uh, Bill, I know you share similar views with Elon, but is there any difference between you and him? I don't think so. Uh, okay. I mean, he actually uh, put some money out to help get some work going on this, and uh, I think that is absolutely fantastic. You know, for people in the audience who want to read about this, I highly recommend this Boston book called Super Intelligence. And, but the basic point that Elon just made that we have a general purpose learning algorithm that evolution has endowed us with. And it's running in an extremely slow computer. Uh, very limited memory size, uh, ability to send data to other computers. We have to use this funny mouth thing here. Uh, and but whenever, it's also we, whenever we build a new one that starts efficient. over, it doesn't know how to walk. It's a really long uh, process. Uh, it, yeah. So 
believe me, as soon as this algorithm of uh, taking experience and turning it into knowledge, which is so amazing and of course we have not done in, in software, as soon as you do that, it's not clear you'll even, even know when you're just at the human level. You'll be at this superhuman level almost as soon as that algorithm is implanted in silicon. And, you know, actually as time goes by, that silicon piece is getting ready to be implanted. The amount of knowledge, as soon as it has that learning algorithm, it just goes out on the internet and reads all the magazines and books and things like that. We have essentially been, been building the content base for the super intelligence. You think you're using the internet, that's actually what you're, you're doing. So, uh, you know, I try not to get too exercised about this, but when people say it's not a problem, that really, then I can start to get really, uh, uh, in a point of disagreement, how can they not see what a, a, a huge challenge this is? Uh, yeah, uh, we, we all understand this will have huge impacts uh, uh, in, uh, in the society in the future and many companies include Microsoft and Baidu, we all invest heavily in artificial intelligence. Uh, during a, uh, these days I'm reading a book uh, by Walter uh, Isaacson, uh, The Innovators. Uh, there are lots of detailed uh, uh, stories about how uh, innovations came out. Uh, I guess his point is that innovation come uh, from uh, usually from uh, collective uh, efforts from many talented people. But what I also um, uh, took away is that uh, uh, the U.S. government, especially the military, played a very important role uh, in the uh, uh, advancement of uh, uh, technology. For example, uh, Project Apollo. That generated a very large and steady demand for microchip, which resulted in the, the flourishing of uh, our systematic companies like uh, Intel. And uh, uh, Internet was uh, a, a, a direct uh, output of, of uh, Alpha Net. Uh, so the US government played a very important role in this kind of technology advancements. Uh, earlier this month, uh, I was at the, the CPCC. Uh, meeting in China, I, I made up a public speech uh, uh, advocating a project called China Brain. It's basically a um, artificial intelligence infrastructure put up by the Chinese government. Uh, we're hoping to build the uh, largest uh, AI infrastructure so that uh, companies, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, 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 universities can do research based on this platform. Uh, for, for the two of you, do you have any advice on, on this project? Well, basically, it's fantastic that China's stepping up to fund more basic research. Uh, whether it's in medicine or computer science, you know, that's going to help strengthen its universities, it's going to speed up innovation. President Xi talks a lot about the importance of innovation. Uh, so China has a lot to contribute. You have to be careful how you structure the government's relationship to innovation. Uh, for example, in Japan, they picked some very specific goals and approaches, the so-called fifth generation project, and it was the wrong way to go. In fact, uh, in the 1980s, the U.S. was feeling like, okay, Japan's better than us, they know how to make things better than us, they know how to plan a government AI project better than us, they know how to create TV television better than us, and actually that was a very good period in the U.S. because people were kind of humble. And they looked at our sort of scattered system of many universities and no central plan. But in fact, the work in the 1980s was the very best work that was laying the foundation for so many advances, including the PC, the internet, it was being done by a very distributed system that funded a bunch of where, uh, put aside the Manhattan Project, because that was special and it act actually worked. The way they did their computer science stuff was backing dozens and dozens of different approaches and having contests like the DARPA driving challenge. Now they're having this uh, pretty cool DARPA robot challenge. So I would highly recommend not doing what Japan did uh, and looking at why the U.S. model, decade in and out, has, has been the best. You know? Uh, I, I, mean, I, I pretty much agree with what, what Will said. Uh, but, uh, I mean, 
it's important to create an, an environment that uh, fosters innovation, and uh, but you want it to, you want it to let it sort of evolve in a Darwinian way, um, as opposed to sort of pick a, you don't want to have a sort of high, a high level, like I've sort of pick a, a technology um, and decide that that's the best thing that's going to work because it may not be, um, and you, you know, it's just you know, it's really. You should really let, let, let things fall. But I mean, if, but if there's high level support for innovation and and uh, and, 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 this is, and particularly making sure that the penalty for, for, for failure on is, is low, if you, if you don't want to have failure to, to punitive, I mean, well, that's one of the keys to Silicon Valley's success. Because there, there are many uh, founders and companies that have been very successful, but in the past the, the company failed. Uh, but they just they quickly reconstituted. People uh, left and joined other companies, and it's really good at, at recycling um, and going through uh, recursive self-improvement. Um, so that it's that that's I think a, a really critical thing. Um, if, 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 if you're going to say you want to support innovation and new technology, which is again you don't know what the path is. There's no map. There's no by its nature it's unknown, which means you're going to make false moves. Uh, so you must, uh, it must be okay to make false moves. Hey, did you have a company before PayPal, or was that your first? I, I did. Uh, yeah, it's a two. That was before PayPal. Yeah. And did you have one before Baidu? Mm, not really. I, I had some uh, ideas, but uh, it was not uh, in the form of a company or in the form of a startup. But, yeah. but speaking of that, I, I think uh, uh, Bill, you became famous way before uh, Elon and I uh, started our company. <laughs> so you probably had the chance to uh, know some of the uh, last generation entrepreneurs. Is there anyone that you have uh, uh, contact with uh, and you have respects and, and you, you learn things from? Uh, is there anyone like that? Well, the, you know, when I started Microsoft, IBM was the dominant company. Uh, and they were sort of this behemoth. And then we ended up uh, creating together with them the uh, so-called IBM personal computer that ships in 1981. So it's kind of funny to be working with them. And uh, we learned a lot from them. And there were some great people there like Frank Carey. Then we worked a lot with Intel. Uh, I learned a lot from Andy Grove. Uh, and he's not always nice to me, but that still allowed me to learn. Well, you you were partners, right? What the hell? Uh, yeah, that partnership was uh, more challenging uh, than it might appear from the outside. But, but anyway, Andy was a brilliant person. Some of his books about management are very good. Uh, Gordon Moore, who did more of the chip level technology, is amazing uh, person I worked with, and he's a, also a, a great philanthropist now. Um, you know, Steve Jobs was an incredible person, and part of the reason he was so incredible is he was so good at engineering great products, even though he didn't know much about engineering. His ability to pick people and define what the product should be without really understanding the rules of software or, or chip actually made his talent all the more amazing. Uh, and the way he built groups and the way he, he pulled things together. So there were a ton of great people I learned from. I may have learned more from Warren Buffett, who's completely outside all the crazy computer industry stuff, but his basic views about business and how he worked in business actually had more influence on me than any other single person. Uh, uh, also, I'd say having the Japanese for customers, even though I'm saying in the 1980s they weren't structuring things well, their emphasis on quality and Microsoft had about 40% of its sales coming from Japan for uh, five to four early years. Their emphasis on quality really woke us up uh, and changed a lot of, of how we did things. Uh, so that was a huge uh, evolutionary push for us. Mm -hmm. So is there any kind of more outside of technology sector? I, I know uh, Warren Buffett, but he, he's a, more like an investor, right? Any uh, interviewers that you uh, you have contact and you, you know things. Well, now that I'm in a uh, phase of philanthropy, I'm getting to meet a lot of incredible entrepreneurs in a lot of uh, different business areas. But 
when I was starting Microsoft and people would say to me, you're an entrepreneur, I'd always say, well, what does that mean? I'm a software guy. You know, I didn't wake up and decide, shall I do, I'm, I'm a generic entrepreneur and shall I do barber shops or cookies or, oh. So I was a software person. You know, at age 12, I was writing software. At age 13, I was writing software. There was only one thing that I had a chance to be world class at, which was the thing I was obsessively doing from age 11 to 17. And so it's not like I could have started a company doing anything else in the, the universe. You know, I'm, I'm a software person. And then I had to learn, oh, God, you have to hire people. Oh, God, you have to fire people. That's a lot of fun. Uh, you have to do budgets. You have to sell things. You got to go to conventions and have booths and stand there and, you know, flog your wares. So I wanted to have software for myself that would be empowered for myself. Uh, and then I had to learn, okay, there's contracts and many things that go along, along with that. So in some ways, you know, the drive all came from the dream about software, not some dream about, okay, I'm going to have a company, let's just pick an industry and go, go get it done. Well, it, it's been some years since you were 13. And when you look back, when you reflect on uh, um, your previous life and compare yours with the other uh, successful entrepreneurs, and when you look at uh, the, the younger generation, uh, do you see any difference between each uh, generation of entrepreneurs? Uh, uh, I guess there are probably a lot of commonalities among different generations, but is there a sort of uh, evolution that the next generation entrepreneurs are uh, better or smarter or stronger? Do you see anything like that? Uh, well, I'm very impressed uh, with Mark Zuckerberg. I've gotten to know him well. And, you know, I'm impressed that the current generation is actually pretty good about asking us old me, because uh, I'm old from these guys. You know, what mistakes did you make? Uh, how should things work? You know, our generation was, in a sense, it was a cleaner sheet of paper. So every conference I would go to would be people our age. There weren't older people. And then, you know, all the analysts or venture capital people who we worked with all kind of grew up. But it was an industry of people in their 20s and then in their 30s. Now, it's much more age diverse. Uh, you know, Mark's about 32 or something, and he's not anywhere near the youngest guy. He's the youngest guy with a mega, mega success uh, uh, type company. I think maybe this group is a little more mellow. Um, you know, Steve was kind of crazy in a certain way, and I was kind of crazy in a certain way. Uh, maybe it's a little harder to be. But I guess it's a more mellow a trend. Do you, do you see that? No, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to characterize because there's there's very diverse personalities. Some of whom I'd like to uh, meet, but you know, I have don't have a chance to. You know, like the guys at Tencent, I don't know. Uh, all of well, Jack Ma, I've gotten to know, um, and you know, people tend to be on their best behavior when they're meeting, uh, you know, other people. Understand what it's like in the engineering meeting, where somebody comes in and tells you, "Oh, this thing isn't working; it's going to be late," uh, or "Hey, it's just too damn slow. Uh, do we have to build it, rebuild it from scratch?" That's where you would. I would love to be in there and see how they deal with. Uh, the various challenges, because all these businesses get externally, internally, uh, to the point where they they have to rethink some of the assumptions they made. And you know, at, at every point, Microsoft is more successful. People are saying, "Well, that's their final success." And it really bugged me because when people were saying, "Oh, eventually they'll get it wrong," I knew that was true. I mean, the companies I grew up admiring, uh, I wonder if anybody's ever heard of Wayne and, and Digital Equipment. You know, which are long, long gone. But those were the great companies. And it was probably good for me to see them fail because it meant that just the wonderful technology and the great people they had in no way protected them from uh, when, the, when the marketplace turned left and they didn't notice uh, that was happening, that uh, none of their excellence protected them from missing a, a market change. Uh, I would say uh, there are probably a lot of commonalities among those uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, I, uh, I also read uh, something about you. Uh, 
you were quite rebellious when, when you were at college. You only uh, choose to audit those uh, classes you didn't register for. And you uh, non stop working for like 36 hours and class for 10 hours. And, and when you wake up, you, you, you just keep on working. Do you think that's the kind of thing a uh, successful entrepreneur need to have? Well, as I said, I think Steve and I were in our own different ways, not the same ways. I didn't take as much acid as he did. Uh, we were kind of crazy. And I don't think that's a necessary part. You know, people debate, you know, could Steve have still been great and been nicer to people? And my answer is yes. You know, he was great. I'm not taking anything away from that. But, uh, you know, in my case, I think, okay, there were periods I was very tough on, on people, partly because I was very tough on myself. And you have to learn not to project that into your management style, which is kind of a natural uh, thing. The harder thing was, that I've been a, you know, in my school, I, I was known as the guy who was good at math. And so then I went to Harvard. I was in this class with 80 people, all of whom's personal positioning where they were the best person they'd ever met at math. And so 79 of us were a fraud. Uh, uh, eventually, I came in second in the class. Uh, and the guy who came in first is a very successful lawyer in New York City. Uh, but this idea of never attending classes, that was just to have some unique positioning that uh, you know, I, I wasn't the same as all those other 80 guys. It's like yours. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I didn't expect to create numbers or anything like that. So it's, it's really, and I, I think it's, it, it, is, it is better to approach this from the standpoint of saying, um, if, 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 rather than like you want to be an entrepreneur or you want to make money, it's like what is some useful thing that you could do that you wish existed in work? Um, and then uh, try to get other people to work with you to create that thing and keep making it better and better. Um, and if you do create something useful, then money will be the result. Uh, but it's but that that's just the way that the you know properly working economy kind of rewards the creation of useful goods and services. And if you create something that you, that, that you love and you think other people will love, it's, very, it's much easier to sort of sacrifice the time and spend the effort. And, um, and if it doesn't work out, you don't regret it. You know, it's, it's, it's a good way to go. Yeah, but have you ever thought of this thing that, OK, I'm, I'm younger than Bill Gates, and uh, I don't want to exactly copy him. Is there any difference between them? Substantially, you know, some, 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 some similarities, particularly uh, growing up, um, and uh, you know, I agree with a lot of uh, what like, pretty much everything they've all said that year. Uh, but um, yeah, my life kind of took me in a different direction. I said most of it, most of the first part came on software, and then um, yeah, and then, I, then I was like, well, it doesn't seem like people are, are really solving the electric car or the bottle chains thing or, or the space thing, and so I thought I'd give it a try. Probably lose, you know, you know, lose, lose the money that I put into it. But I thought it was worth really, really giving it a try, and that was really the only thing. Um, and, uh, and I had to learn how you make hard work. Uh, so I, I didn't even know. I, I never sort of seen a CNC machine or uh, laid up carbon fiber or you know, I didn't know any of these things. But but you know, if you read books. And, talk to experts, you will you can pick it up pretty quickly. In fact, I think people self-limit their ability to learn. Um, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Just read books and talk to people. Um, and, uh, yeah, and particularly, particularly books. I mean, you can, the data rate reading is much greater than when, when somebody's, like, talking. I mean, I, you know, just, uh, like, uh, what's, the, what's the output rate of, of speech? It's like a couple hundred. But per second, I mean, maybe a few thousand bits per second, if you're really going full tilt. Um, so you, you can do several times that. Reading. That's the main reason I didn't go to lectures in college, just because the data rate was too slow. <laughs> so it's like, why is this? Why are, they, why, are they, why are they reading the textbooks? I mean, this is like a bedtime story. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, since we are at Boa, this is not a pure technology conference, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, 
government officials coming here. Uh, yesterday, I think both of you met this president Xi Jinping, and uh, about, about a week ago, uh, Singapore's funded, uh, funding premier Singapore passed away. Uh, he's a uh, very well respected uh, uh, statesman. Uh, president Xi also said he made outstanding contributions to the peace and development of the Asia. Uh, region. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Chinese leaders from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Mr. Li Guangyao, uh, they, they share something in common. Uh, they uh, believe in this kind of technocratic uh, approach uh, running a, a country or a government uh, using an engineering type of uh, methodology. This is very different from the U.S. I think U.S. are pretty much ruled by lawyers. What, <laughs> what are the pros and cons in your eyes between these two different systems? You know? uh, well, I mean, being, being an engineer, I obviously like, tend to favor the engineering approach. Um, I think in the U.S. we, we probably have too many lawyers. Um, and uh, you know, because they shouldn't be lawyers, but probably have more than we should, should have. I mean, generally, I think it's good if the uh, uh, political issue of the country is just taking into question. Uh, and um, so I have some pro and sort of tech technocratic uh, approach. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's I, I, I wish more, there were more people in the American Congress that were proficient in, in science. You met a lot of uh, Chinese government officials, different generations of leaders. You probably have more to say about this. Well, I was very lucky that I got to spend, uh, have a number of dinners with Lee Kuan Yew. And he was not only just thoughtful, just the very idea that he would take parts of the Western system and say, oh, this part is good, this part may not apply everywhere, this part he disagreed with. Uh, it was kind of bold because, of course, the Western system was succeeding. You know, basically all the rich countries in the world had followed the Western system. And so the idea that he thought he would uh, do it slightly differently was a huge contribution. And, you know, it, Singapore is a city state, so you can do things in terms of paying government salaries and excellence there that may not scale up. But what he did was very uh, incredible. What we really want is this mix of democracy and expertise. And no country has that balance right. If you err on the side of democracy, there's certain extreme things about the wrong person getting in power. And, uh, if you kick them out, then how do you get new people in? You know, so the democracy side, they have some huge advantages uh, that have uh, helped the U.S. Uh, quite a bit. It is a little scary now when we have complex problems like how do you run a healthcare system efficiently? Why are why is the U.S. paying so much? And the, there really isn't at this time any elected representative you can have a good discussion about the dynamics of that system and why it's different than other countries and how we might change that. So government has to do with very complex issues. In the Chinese government, uh, although I'd say the trend is a tiny bit away from it, has had engineers and scientists in a lot of the key positions and you know willingness to look at what other countries do. And also this notion that if you're going to have a new policy, you'll often try it out in part of the country, uh, see if it works, uh, and then tune the policy before you try and uh, scale it up in a very broad way. So the Chinese government is a student of policy more than just a uh, say UK Parliament or US Congress where people are kind of yelling each other about, you know, I'm right, no, you're right. It's not like, oh, let's go do an experiment. I've never sat in the you know, US Congress and say, oh, let's try yours out and one state will try it out, mine, and we'll come together and combine the best features. That's not a typical electoral uh, dialogue that we're having uh, right now. So it, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. There are things like how you run universities where the US model you know, other people should just adopt it. Uh, then there's things like health systems and governance where they maybe should take some aspects but try, try out variations so that, you know, we get the benefit of, you know, 192 countries of slightly different experience, including at the subnational level. 
Um, so, uh, the, we have a very strong government. They have uh, very strong execution capabilities when it comes to infrastructure, uh, uh, high speed rail or uh, highways. Uh, we have massive constructions, and uh, now it's probably the largest infrastructure in terms of transportation uh, in the world. Uh, but when you have a strong government, uh, are you concerned about innovation? There might be things that that's too uh, strict that that, that that's a hurt innovation. Well, I don't. Th I think Chinese innovation is going at a very high speed. Uh, I think that the government could raise how much it spends on science research even more than it is. It's 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 raising those things. Um, uh, you know, there have been areas like in the media where you have to say why the Chinese market, although this is starting to change, has been behind in terms of media companies and things. I think a little bit the, the state probably deserves, uh, it's a little bit of the reason the media sector uh, hasn't come further along. But in terms of things like how do you make energy, you know, the state policies are not holding back somebody, you know, figuring out some big invention. In fact, and I have a company, a, a nuclear power company called TerraPower, that really, China's the most natural partner for us with the breakthrough uh, generation of nuclear because China's a lot like the United States was in the 1960s where the idea that you want to go forward and do new things, it's very clear. The idea that the status quo isn't where you want to be. The US today is very careful that, hey, we're pretty happy with the current conditions. So if somebody wants to build a new building or take some new approach, there's a lot of, mm, maybe no, you know, there's like five levels that you go through, maybe no, maybe no. Uh, and so it's, uh, whereas the bias towards moving and doing new things, which has a small downside, but a huge upside as well, uh, you know, I'd say in terms of breakthroughs in some areas, like nuclear, it's more likely to come out of China uh, than almost any other place because of this uh, bias towards doing big projects. And in, in the 1950s, 1960s, that was the U.S. In the 70s, it started to be Japan. Uh, Korea <laughs> took on that role. And you know, that big engineering uh, uh, bias is, is, is great for the world. Uh, so, you know, you are very um, futuristic. Uh, let's say 50 years from now, uh, how would you envision a conference like Boa be uh, done. Do you think we still have to come to the stage and meet face to face, or is there a, a better way for people to communicate as a conference? The airport will be closer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think people also want to do conferences if only for sentimental value. Um, you know, it's, it just feels better to be in proximity to people. I mean, even if you have really perfect uh, virtual reality, they could put in your headgear and your haptic suits and everything and kind of be there. You know, it really feels like you're there. It's still not the same as actually being there. Uh, you know, I think people, it's sort of a natural human being, so want to congregate and be around with you. Um, speaking of transportation, there are lots of uh, buzz about uh, the, the self driving cars. How long do you think it, it's going to take for self-driving cars to become mainstream in the U.S., in China, and in other parts of the world? Uh, sure. First of all, I mean, let, me, let me preface this by just saying that the, you know, with, with something where there's an enormous industrial base like, uh, like cars, um, if, if anything that happens en masse is going to take time. So there's, there's about 2 billion cars and trucks on the road. Uh, global capacity is for production capacity is about 100 billion cars and trucks a year. Um, so let's say tomorrow we, we had self-driving cars that work perfectly. It would still take a long time to switch out the, uh, the mass industrial base. Uh, it would take you know, 20 years if, if there was the same number of cars and trucks. There's probably some smaller number of cars and trucks and things are autonomous, but, but it's still, uh, it still will still take, take a while. Um, so, so I think, but to answer the question, say, where do I think the the first uh, production uh, self-driving car will, will exist that people can, can buy. Um, it's probably, uh, well, in terms of the technology working, I, I think we're not more than five years away from, 
having cars that are way safer than here. Yeah, but for mainstream adoption, there needs to be laws and uh, government support. Sure. That's why I said from a technology standpoint. Right. So, at the point where you have the technology working, then you have to convince the regulators that it's truly safe. Yeah. Um, so you'd be perfectly running biologically cars in shadow mode, where there's still be uh, human driving, um, and you evaluate what the what the uh, narrow AI on the car was doing compared to the human actions, um, and then you'd be able to statistically prove. Uh, that the, the narrow eye of the car uh, would have been safer than, than the person. Um, and it's going to take at least two or three years. So from the point at which, at which it actually works, I would expect that there'd be some delay in the regulatory approval on, on the, uh, of, of at least two or three years. Yeah, I might point out to that is that it won't be monolithic. Uh, that is, you know, Companies like Microsoft have people coming in all the time saying, we're going to do the most advanced city in the world. Well, now it's clear, if you want to design a city that assumes that drones are allowed to deliver things and you know, come up with ways of, of uh, uh, sort of onboard client-side collision avoidance, and you want to assume you need no parking garages because these self-driving cars are around, we should have a few dozen jurisdictions in the world to decide to get out there in front, get the benefits and the, the challenges of that, just so we get you know, hundreds of millions of hours of uh, this software seen, you know, all come into the street uh, and all that thing. Some pioneers you know, do, uh, there's some downside with it. But so that's why it's good we don't have one government. Uh, even in China, they should pick some places and have super liberal rules. So I think we're a few years away from having, say, a dozen jurisdictions say, let's just go for it and design this in. And then within a decade, we'll see the benefits as well as a, a few of the problems. So besides the government, is there any other uh, factors or, or uh, uh, type of people who need to be prepared about this uh, uh, you know, driverless cars? What kind of preparation? for people like us need, need to have? Well, the benefits are mainly when you design a city from scratch, assuming that you get, you get this well, thing. We don't have that kind of luxury in most cases. There That's right. There are many mega cities, and how, how can we smoothly transition to that kind of well, society? You can, you can have a regulatory environment where things like Uber are allowed to come in. Uber's a form of, of a driverless car. It's just uh, using sort of on-demand uh, human labor to efficiently uh, provide that service. And you know, so you think about Uber for everything, the way we use capital equipment, and uh, it's it's pretty exciting that the very market mechanism of when resources should be used in a different way was very inefficient uh, until we had this digital template, and now we're seeing that the matching of I want to use an asset, I have an asset, has been amped up. Uh, that, that matching function is way less friction now than, than ever before. So it's changing a whole ton of things about uh, capital goods and, and labor usage. So, um, Ivan, do you see Uber as a partner or competitor? Or what's going to happen when nobody needs to drive the car? <laughs> I think it's you know, either a partner or a competitor. I mean, we're just making cars. So, like, we work to buy the cars, other people can buy the cars, and um, and, um, yeah, and, and they'll gradually get more autonomous. Uh, and, uh, but, but again, I do want to emphasize that, that the point I made about the industrial base switchover okay. means that this is not going to be an overnight thing. It's literally impossible for it to be an overnight transition. Because two million million cost trucks, 100 million year cost trucks may have maximum capacity per year. So we should we should be panicked about what are you going to do? What do you think like people are going to lose their jobs the moment a self driving car arrives? It's like that's, that's impossible. Unless you want to self driving cars, they work for one. Uh, so, but, but yeah, I mean, things, things will be up on this. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of what will happen in, in that environment. So, yeah. Well, one hour is a very short time, but we, uh, I think we covered a lot. We talked about history, we talked about future, and I think uh, uh, in a lot of times, um, uh, 
history tell us what the future will look like, and I sincerely hope that uh, uh, our generation can learn from the history and make contributions to uh, the, the next few generations so that they can benefit from our effort. And with that, I thank you all both for coming to this session. Thank you.